The Mamluk Sultanate Arabic, Romanized, Sultanat al was a medieval realm spanning Egypt, the Levant, and Hejaz. It lasted from the overthrow of the Ayyubid dynasty until the Ottoman conquest of Egypt in 1517. Historians have traditionally broken the era of Mamluk rule into two periods, one covering 1250 to 1382, the other, 1382 to 1517. Western historians call the former the Bari period and the latter the Burji due to the political dominance of the regimes known by these names during the respective eras. Contemporary Muslim historians refer to the same divisions as the Turkic and Circassian periods in order to stress the change in the ethnic origins of the majority of Mamluks. The Mamluk state reached its height under Turkic rule with Arabic culture and then fell into a prolonged phase of decline under the Circassians. The Sultanate's ruling caste was composed of Mamluks, soldiers of predominantly Cuman Kipchaks from Crimea, Circassian, Abkhazian, Oghuz Turks and Georgian slave origin. While Mamluks were purchased, their status was above ordinary slaves, who were not allowed to carry weapons or perform certain tasks. Mamluks were considered to be true lords, with social status above citizens of Egypt. Though it declined towards the end of its existence, at its height the Sultanate represented the zenith of medieval Egyptian and Levantine political, economic, and cultural glory in the Islamic Golden Age. Name The term Mamluk Sultanate is a modern historiographical term. The Arabic sources for the period of the Bari Mamluks refer to the dynasty as the state realm of the Turks, Arabic Dawlat al-Atrak, Dawlat al-Turk, al dawla al turkiya Other official names used were State of the Circassians, Dawlat al jarakiza A variant thereof, al dawla al turkiya al jarkashia emphasized the fact that the Circassians were Turkish speaking. Some misconception names include the Bari Sultanate period Dawlat al bariya and the Burji Sultanate period al dawla al bariya These were rarely used by medieval Mamluk historians but are currently used as sub periods of the Mamluk Sultanates. The term Mongol state, al dawla al Mughalia, was used during Sultan al Adil Kitbuga's rule, who was of Mongol extraction. During Baybars al Jashenkur's reign, the state was known as al dawla al Bariya, which meant the Burji Sultanate period, when in fact he was a ruler during the Bari Sultanate period but was of Circassian extraction that dominated in Burji Sultanate period. Dawlat al Karlawan, or Dawlat Bani Karlawan, which means, Karlawani state, dynasty, which have ruled for 100 years between 1279 and 1382. Al dawla al Zahiriya, which meant, Zahiri state, dynasty. Which is the dynasty of Baybars and his two sons Al Said Baraka and Solomish. This dynasty ruled consecutively for 19 years. Topic: History. Topic: Origins. The Mamluk was an own slave distinguished from the gulam, or household slave. After thorough training in various fields such as martial arts, court etiquette and Islamic sciences, these slaves were freed. However, they were still expected to remain loyal to their master and serve his household. Mamluks had formed a part of the state or military apparatus in Syria and Egypt since at least the 9th century, during the Tullinid period. Mamluk regiments constituted the backbone of Egypt's military under Ayyubid rule in the late 12th and early 13th centuries, beginning with Sultan Saladin r. 1174 who replaced the Fatimids' black African infantry with Mamluks. Each Ayyubid sultan and high-ranking emir had a private Mamluk corps. Most of the Mamluks in the Ayyubid service were ethnic Kipchak Turks from Central Asia, who, upon entering service, were converted to Sunni Islam and taught Arabic. They were highly committed to their masters, who they often referred to as father, and were in turn treated more as kinsmen than as slaves by their masters. Sultan as Saleh Ayyub R. 1240-1249, the last of the Ayyubid sultans, had acquired some 1,000 Mamluks some of them free-born from Syria, Egypt and the Arabian Peninsula by 1229, while serving as Naib Viceroy of Egypt during the absence of his father, Sultan al-Kamil R. 1218-1238. These Mamluks were called the Salihia, singular Salihi, after their master. As Saleh became Sultan of Egypt in 1240, and upon his accession to the Ayyubid throne, he manumitted and promoted large numbers of his original and newly recruited Mamluks on the condition that they remain in his service. 
to provision his Mamluks, as Saleh forcibly seized the IQTA at fiefs, singular IQTA, of his predecessors' emirs. As Saleh sought to create a paramilitary apparatus in Egypt loyal to him, and his aggressive recruitment and promotion of Mamluks led contemporaries to view Egypt as Saleh he ridden, according to historian Winslow William Clifford. Despite his close relationship with his Mamluks, tensions existed between as Saleh and the Salihia, and a number of Salihi Mamluks were imprisoned or exiled throughout as Saleh's reign. While historian Stephen Humphreys asserts that the Salihia's increasing dominance of the state did not personally threaten as Saleh due to their fidelity to him, Clifford believes the Salihia developed an autonomy within the state that fell short of such loyalty. Opposition among the Salihia to as Saleh rose when the latter ordered the assassination of his brother Abu Bakr al Adil in 1249, a task which many of the Salihia were affronted by and rejected. Four of the Salihia ultimately agreed to execute the controversial operation. <laughs> Rise to power <laughs> Conflict with the Ayyubids Tensions between as Saleh and his Mamluks came to a head later in 1249 when Louis IX of France's forces captured Damietta in their bid to conquer Egypt during the Seventh Crusade. As Saleh believed Damietta should not have been evacuated and was rumored to have threatened punitive action against the Damietta garrison. The rumor, accentuated by the execution of civilian notables who evacuated Damietta, provoked a mutiny by the garrison of his camp in Al Mansura, which included numerous Salihi Mamluks. The situation was calmed after the intervention of the Atabeg al Askar, commander of the military, Fak ad Din ibn Sheikh al Shuyuk. As the Crusaders advanced, As Saleh died and was succeeded by his son al Muazzam Turansha, who was in Al Jazeera at the time. Initially, the Salihia welcomed Turansha's succession, with many greeting him and requesting confirmation of their administrative posts and IQTA assignments at his arrival to the Egyptian frontier. However, two ranchers sought to challenge the dominance of the Salihia in the paramilitary apparatus by promoting his Kurdish retinue from Al Jazeera and Syria as a counterweight to the predominantly Turkish Salihia. Before two ranchers could arrive at the front, the Barya, a junior regiment of the Salihia, defeated the Crusaders at the Battle of Al Mansura and captured Louis, effectively ending the Crusade. Two ranchers proceeded to place his own entourage and Mamluks, known as the Muazamiya, in positions of authority to the detriment of Salihi interests. On 2 May 1250, a group of disgruntled Salihi officers had two rancher assassinated at his camp in Farisqa, according to Humphreys, as Saleh's frequent wars against his Ayyubid relatives likely voided the Salihia's loyalty to other members of the Ayyubid dynasty. Nonetheless, the Salihia were careful not to depict the assassination of two rancher as an assault against Ayyubid legitimacy, but rather an act against a deviant of the Muslim polity. Moreover, an electoral college dominated by the Salihia convened to choose a successor to Turansha among the Ayyubid emirs, with opinion largely split between a Nazir Yusuf of Damascus and al Mughith Umar of al Karak. Ultimately, however, consensus settled on as Saleh's widow, Shaja ad Dur. Shaja ad Dur ensured the Salihia's dominance of the paramilitary elite, and ushered in a process of establishing patronage and kinship ties with the Salihia. In particular, she cultivated close ties with the Jamdari place. Jamdaria and Bari place Bariya. elements of the Salihia, by distributing to them IQTA and other benefits. The Bariya were named after the Arabic word bar, meaning sea, or large river, because their barracks was located on the Nile River island of Rorda. They were mostly drawn from among the Cumans Kipchaks who controlled the steppes north of the Black Sea. Shaja al durs efforts and the lingering desire among the military in Egypt to maintain the Ayyubid state was made evident when the Salihi Mamluk and Atabeg al Askar, Ibik, attempted to claim the Sultanate, but was prevented from monopolizing power by the army and the Bariya and Jamdariya, which asserted that only an Ayyubid could exercise Sultanate authority. The Bariya compelled Ibik to share power with al Ashraf Musa, a grandson of Sultan al Kamil. Factional power struggles Ibik was one of the oldest of the Salihi Mamluks and a senior member of a Salih's inner circle, despite only being an emir or sat middle-ranked emir. He served as the principal bulwark against the more junior Bari and Jamdari elements of the Salihia, and his promotion to Atabeg al Askar was met by Bari rioting in Cairo, the first of many examples of intra-Salihi tensions surrounding Ibik's ascendancy. 
The Barya and Jamdaya were represented by their patron, Faris ad-Din Akhtay, a principal organizer of Turanch's assassination and the recipient of Fak ad-Din's large estate by Shaja al-Dur. The latter saw Akhtay as a counterweight to Ibik. Ibik moved against the Barya in 1251 by shutting down their Rauda headquarters in a bid to sap Akhtay's power base. Ibik was still unable to promote his own Mamluks, known as the Muitsiya, to senior posts until 1252. That year, he managed to dispatch Akhtay to Upper Egypt to suppress an Arab uprising. Instead of isolating Akhtay as was Ibik's intention, the assignment allowed Akhtay to impose extortionate taxes in Upper Egypt and provide him the personal funds to finance his patronage of the Bayah. In 1254, Ibik had his Muizi Mamluks assassinate Akhtay in the citadel of Cairo. Afterward, Ibik proceeded to purge those in his retinue and in the Salihiyah who he believed were disloyal to him, causing a temporary exodus of Bari Mamluks, most of whom settled in Gaza, but also in Upper Egypt and Syria. The purge led to a dearth of military support for Ibik, which in turn led to Ibik's recruitment of new supporters from among the army in Egypt and the Turkish Nazari and Azizi Mamluks from Syria, who had defected from their Ayyubid masters, namely in Nazir Yusuf, and moved to Egypt in 1250. The Syrian Mamluks were led by their patron Jamal ad-Din Adi and were assigned most of the IQTA of Akhtay and his allies. However, Adi's growing ambitions made Ibik view him as a threat. After Ibik learned that Adi was plotting to topple him and recognize a Nazir Yusuf as Ayyubid Sultan, which would likely leave Adi in virtual control of Egypt, Ibik had Adi imprisoned in Alexandria in 1254 or 1255. Meanwhile, the Barya faction in Gaza, commanded by Baybars, sought to enlist their services with a Nazir Yusuf. In an attempt to dislodge Ibik, the Barya petitioned a Nazir Yusuf to claim the Ayyubid throne and invade Egypt, but a Nazir Yusuf initially refused. However, in 1256, he dispatched a Bari-led expedition to Egypt, but no battle occurred when Ibik met a Nazir Yusuf's army. Ibik was assassinated on 10 April 1257, possibly on the orders of Shaja al-Dur, who was assassinated a week later. Their deaths left a relative power vacuum in Egypt, with Ibik's teenage son, Al-Mansa Ali, as heir to the Sultanate. While Al-Mansa Ali was Sultan, the strongman in Egypt was Ibik's former close aide, Syf ad-Din Kudas, who also had hostile relations with the Salihiyah, including the Bari Mamluks. By the time of Ibik's death, the Bariya had entered the service of Al-Mughid Umar of al karik who agreed to invade Egypt and claim the Ayyubid Sultanate, but Al-Mughid's small Bari-dominated invading force was routed at the frontier with Egypt in November. The Bariya and Al-Mughid launched a second expedition in 1258, but were again defeated. The Bariya subsequently raided areas around Syria, threatening a Nazir Yusuf's power in Damascus. After a first attempt to defeat the Bariya near Gaza failed, and Nazir Yusuf launched a second expedition against him with Al-Mansa Muhammad II of Hama, resulting in a Bariya defeat at Jericho. And Nazir Yusuf proceeded to besiege Al-Mughid and the Bariya at al karik but the growing threat of a Mongol invasion of Syria ultimately led to a reconciliation between a Nazir Yusuf and Al-Mughid, and Baybar's defection to the former. Kudas deposed Al-Mansa Ali in 1259. Afterward, he purged and or arrested the Muitsiya and any Bari Mamluks he could locate in Egypt in a bid to eliminate dissent towards his rule. The surviving Muizi and Bari Mamluks made their way to Gaza, where Baybars had created a virtual shadow state in opposition to Kudas. While various Mamluk factions competed for control of Egypt and Syria, the Mongols under the command of Hulagu Khan had sacked Baghdad, the intellectual and spiritual center of the Islamic world, in 1258, and proceeded westward, capturing Aleppo and Damascus. Kudas sent military reinforcements to his erstwhile enemy and Nazir Yusuf in Syria, and reconciled with the Bariya, including Baybars, who was allowed to return to Egypt, to face the common Mongol threat. Hulagu sent emissaries to Kudas in Cairo, demanding submission to Mongol rule. Kudas had the emissaries killed, an act which historian Joseph Cummins called the worst possible insult to the Mongol throne. Kudas then prepared Cairo's defenses to ward off the Mongols' threatened invasion of Egypt, but after hearing news that Hulagu withdrew from Syria to claim the Mongol throne, Kudas began preparations for the conquest of Syria. He mobilized a force of some 120,000 soldiers and gained the support of his main Mamluk rival, Baybars. The Mamluks entered Palestine to confront the Mongol army that Hulagu left behind under the command of Kitbuka. In September 1260, the two sides met in the plains south of Nazareth in a major confrontation known as the Battle of Anjalut. 
Kudas had some of his cavalry units hide in the hills around Angelut, Goliath Spring, while directing Baybars's forces to advance past Angelut against Kitbuka's Mongols. In the ensuing half-hour clash, Baybars' men feigned a retreat and were pursued by Kitbuka. The latter's forces fell into a Mamluk trap once they reached the springs of Angelut, with Baybars' men turning around to confront the Mongols and Kutuz's units ambushing the Mongols from the hills. The battle ended in a Mongol rout and Kitbuka's capture and execution. Afterward, the Mamluks proceeded to recapture Damascus and the other Syrian cities taken by the Mongols. Upon Kutuz's triumphant return to Cairo, he was assassinated in a Bari plot. Baybars subsequently assumed power in Egypt in late 1260, and established the Bari Mamluk Sultanate. Topic. Bari rule Topic. Reign of Baybars Baybars rebuilt the Bari's former headquarters in Rorda Island and put Karluan, one of his most senior associates, in command of it. In 1263, Baybars deposed al Mughith of al Karak based on allegations of collaborating with the Mongol Ilkhanate of Persia, and thus consolidated his authority over Muslim Syria. During his early reign and through heavy financial expense, Baybars rebuilt and stringently trained the Mamluk army, which grew from 10,000 cavalry to 40,000, with a 4,000-strong royal guard at its core. The new force was rigidly disciplined and highly trained in horsemanship, swordsmanship and archery. Another major component to Baybars' rule was intrastate communication. To accomplish this, he instituted a postal network that extended across the cities of Egypt and Syria. The need for smooth delivery of correspondence also led to the large-scale repair or construction of roads and bridges along the postal route. Baybars attempted to institute dynastic rule by assigning his four-year-old son al said Baraka as co-sultan, thereby ending the Mamluk tradition of electing a leader, but this effort was ultimately unsuccessful, at least for his Zahirid household. Successful rulership became highly dependent on Baybars' personal qualities. However, Baybar's success in establishing centralized rule resulted in the consolidation of the Mamluk Sultanate. Through opening diplomatic channels with the Mongols, Baybars also sought to stifle a potential alliance between the Mongols and the Christian powers of Europe, while also sowing divisions between the Mongol Ilkhanate and the Mongol Golden Horde. In addition, his diplomacy was also intended to maintain the flow of Turkic Mamluks from Mongol-held Central Asia. With Bari power in Egypt and Muslim Syria consolidated by 1265, Baybars launched expeditions against the Crusader fortresses throughout Syria, capturing Asuf in 1265, and Halba and Arka in 1266. According to historian Thomas Asbridge, the methods used to capture Asuf demonstrated the Mamluks' grasp of siege craft and their overwhelming numerical and technological supremacy. Baybar's strategy regarding the Crusader fortresses along the Syrian coast was not to capture and utilize the fortresses, but to destroy them and thus prevent their potential future use by new waves of Crusaders. In August 1266, the Mamluks launched a punitive expedition against the Armenian Cilician Kingdom for its alliance with the Mongols, laying waste to numerous to Armenian villages and significantly weakening the kingdom. At around the same time, Baybar's forces captured Safad from the Knights Templar, and shortly after, Ramla, both cities in interior Palestine. Unlike the coastal Crusader fortresses, the Mamluks strengthened and utilized the interior cities as major garrisons and administrative centers. Campaigns against the Crusaders continued in 1267, and in the spring of 1268, Baybar's forces captured Jaffa before conquering the major Crusader fortress of Antioch on 18 May. Baybars initiated a more aggressive policy than his predecessors toward the Christian Nubian kingdom of Makuria on Egypt's southern border. In 1265, the Mamluks launched an invasion of northern Makuria, and forced the Nubian king to become a vassal of the Mamluks. Around that time, the Mamluks had conquered the Red Sea areas of Suakin and the Dalek Archipelago, while attempting to extend their control to the Hejaz, the desert regions west of the Nile, and Cyrenaica. In 1268, the Makurian king, David I, overthrew the Mamluks' vassal and in 1272, raided the Mamluk Red Sea port of Adhab. Meanwhile, Louis IX of France launched the Eighth Crusade, this time targeting Tunis with the intention of ultimately invading Egypt. However, Louis IX died, allowing the Mamluks to refocus their efforts at further conquests of Crusader territories in Syria, including the county of Tripoli's Crack des Chevaliers fortress, which Baybars captured in 1271. 
Despite an alliance with the assassins in 1272, in July 1273, the Mamluks, who by then determined that the assassins' independence was problematic, wrested control of the assassins' fortresses in Jabal Ansariya, including Masyaf. In 1275, the Mamluk governor of Qus, with Bedouin allies, launched an expedition against Makuria, defeating King David near Dongola in 1276, and installed Shakandar as king. This brought the fortress of Qasr Ibrim under Mamluk jurisdiction. The conquest of Nubia was not permanent, however, and the process of invading the region and installing a vassal king would be repeated by Baybar's successors. Nonetheless, Baybar's initial conquest led the annual expectation of tribute from the Nubians by the Mamluks until the Makurian kingdom's demise in the mid-14th century. Furthermore, the Mamluks also received the submission of King Adar of al-Abwab further south. In 1277, Baybars launched an expedition against the Ilkhanids, routing them in Elbistan in Anatolia, before ultimately withdrawing to avoid overstretching their forces and risk being cut off from Syria by a second, large incoming Ilkhanid army. <laughs> Early Karlawani period In July 1277, Baybars died en route to Damascus, and was succeeded by Baraka. However, the latter's ineptness precipitated a power struggle that ended with Karluan being elected sultan in November 1279. The Ilkhanids took advantage of the disarray of Baybar's succession by raiding Mamluk Syria, before launching a massive offensive against Syria in the autumn of 1281. Karluan's forces were significantly outnumbered by the estimated 80,000 strong Ilkhanid Armenian Georgian Seljuk coalition, but marched north from Damascus to meet the Ilkhanid army at Homs. In the 28th of October Battle of Homs, the Mamluks routed the Ilkhanids and confirmed Mamluk dominance in Syria. The defeat of the Ilkhanids allowed Karluan to proceed and eliminate the remaining Crusader outposts in Syria. In May 1285, he captured the Markab fortress and garrisoned it. Karluan's early reign was marked by policies that were meant to gain the support of important societal elements, namely the merchant class, the Muslim bureaucracy and the religious establishment. Among these early policies were the elimination of illegal taxes that burdened the merchant community and extensive building and renovation projects for Islam's holiest sites, such as the Prophet's Mosque in Medina, the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron. Following the détente with the Ilkhanate after 1280, Karluan launched a wide arrest campaign to eliminate internal dissent, imprisoning dozens of high-ranking emirs in Egypt and Syria. The détente also saw a shift in Karluan's building activities to focus on more secular and personal purposes, including a large multi-division hospital complex in Cairo across from the tomb of his Saleh Ayyub. Construction of the hospital, a contrast from his Mamluk predecessors who focused on establishing madrasas, was done to gain the goodwill of the public, create a lasting legacy, and secure his spot in the afterlife. Its location facing as Saleh's tomb was meant to demonstrate Karluan's lasting connection to his master and to honor the Salihia. While the Salihi Mamluks were typically Kipchak Turks, Karluan diversified Mamluk ranks purchasing numerous non-Turks, particularly Circassians, forming out of them the Burji Regiment. Karluan was the last Salihi Sultan and following his death in 1290, his son, Al-Ashraf Khalil, drew his legitimacy as a Mamluk by emphasizing his lineage from Karluan, thus inaugurating the Karluani period of Bari rule. Like his two Bari predecessors, Khalil's main priorities were organization of the Sultanate, defeat of the Crusaders and the Mongols, incorporation of Syria into the Mamluk domain and preservation of the import of new Mamluks and weaponry. With regards to the latter policy, Baybars had purchased 4,000 Mamluks, Karluan purchased 6,000 to 7,000 and by the end of Khalil's reign, there was an estimated total of 10,000 Mamluks in the Sultanate. In 1291, Khalil captured Acre, the last major crusader fortress in Palestine and thus Mamluk rule extended across the entirety of Syria. Khalil's death in 1293 led to period of factional struggle, with Khalil's prepubescent brother, and Nazir Muhammad, being overthrown the following year by a Mongol Mamluk of Karluan, Al-Adil Kitbuga, who in turn was succeeded by a Greek Mamluk of Karluan, Husam ad-Din Lajan. In a bid to consolidate his control, Lajan attempted to redistribute IQTA to his supporters. Lajan was unable to retain the Sultanate and Al-Nazir Muhammad was restored to power in 1298, ruling a fractious realm until being toppled a second time by Baybars II, a Circassian Mamluk of Karluan, who was known to be more wealthy, pious and cultured than his immediate predecessors. Early into an Nazir Muhammad's second reign, the Ilkhanids, whose leader, Mahmud Ghazan, had converted to Islam, invaded Syria and routed a Mamluk army near Homs in the Battle of Wadi al-Khazandar. 
However, Ghazan withdrew most of his troops from Syria shortly after due to a dearth in fodder for their numerous horses and the residual Ilkhanid force retreated in 1300 at the approach of the rebuilt Mamluk army. A further Ilkhanid invasion in 1303 was repelled after the Ilkhanid defeat at the Battle of Marj al Safa in the plains south of Damascus. Topic. Third reign of an Nazir Muhammad Baybars II ruled for roughly one year before an Nazir Muhammad became Sultan again in 1310, this time ruling for over three consecutive decades in a period that is often considered by historians of the Mamluk period to be the apex of both the Bari regime specifically and the Mamluk Sultanate in general. To avoid the experiences of his previous two reigns where the Mamluks of Kalawan and Khalil held sway and periodically assumed the Sultanate, and Nazir Muhammad launched efforts to establish a centralized autocracy. Early into his third reign, in 1310, and Nazir Muhammad imprisoned, exiled or killed any Mamluk emirs that supported those who toppled him in the past, including the Burji Mamluks. He then assigned emirates to over 30 of his own Mamluks. Initially, and Nazir Muhammad left most of his father's Mamluks undisturbed, but in 1311 and 1316, he imprisoned and executed most of them, and again redistributed emirates to his own Mamluks. By 1316, the number of Mamluks was reduced to 2,000. And Nazir Muhammad went further in imposing his rule by intervening to have al Wathiq succeed Caliph al Mustakfi, as well as compelling the Qadi to issue legal rulings that advanced his interests. The third reign of a Nazir Muhammad also saw a departure from the traditions of succession and administrative elevation of his predecessors since he observed in his first two reigns that such traditions had been ignored anyway, while sultans were being assassinated and Mamluks were abusing other Mamluks in bids for power. Moreover, and Nazir Muhammad's being the son of a Mamluk instead of a Mamluk himself risked undermining his position among the largely Mamluk elite. This partially explains his purges of the thousands of Mamluks purchased by his predecessors. Amid conditions that stemmed the flow of Mamluks from the Mongol-held lands to the Sultanate, and Nazir Muhammad resolved to make up for the loss of the purged Mamluks by adopting new methods of training and military and financial advancement that introduced a great level of permissiveness. This permissiveness, which manifested in far more relaxed conditions for new Mamluks, encouraged the pursuit of military careers in Egypt by aspiring Mamluks outside of the country, to the point that parents would sell their children as Mamluks with the belief that children would enjoy an improved standard of living. Under an Nazir Muhammad, the Mamluks successfully repelled an Ilkhanid invasion of Syria in 1313 and then concluded a peace treaty with the Ilkhanate in 1322, bringing a long lasting end to the Mamluk Mongol Wars. Following the détente, and Nazir Muhammad was able to usher in a period of stability and prosperity in the Sultanate through the enacting of major political, economic and military reforms that were ultimately intended to ensure his continued rule and consolidate the Kalawanid Bari regime. Concurrent with an Nazir Muhammad's reign was the disintegration of the Ilkhanate into several smaller dynastic states and the consequent Mamluk effort to establish diplomatic and commercial relationships with the new political entities. And Nazir Muhammad also attempted to assert permanent Mamluk control over the Makurian vassal state, launching an invasion in 1316 and installing a Muslim Nubian king, Abdullah Bashambu. The latter was overthrown by Kanz al Dawla, who and Nazir Muhammad temporarily ousted in a 1323 24 expedition. <laughs> End of the Bari regime And Nazir Muhammad died in 1341 and his rule was followed by a succession of his descendants to the throne in a period marked by political instability. Most of his successors, except for an Nazir Hassan, are 1347 to 1351, 1354 to 1361, and Al Ashraf Shaban, are 1363 to 1367, were sultans in name only, with the patrons of the leading Mamluk factions holding actual power. The first of an Nazir Muhammad's son to accede to the Sultanate was Abu Bakr, who an Nazir Muhammad designated as his successor before his death. However, an Nazir Muhammad's senior aide, Kassan, held real power and ultimately imprisoned and executed Abu Bakr and had an Nazir Muhammad's infant son, Al Ashraf Kajuk, appointed in his stead. By January 1342, however, Kassan and Kajuk were toppled, and the latter's half brother, an Nazir Ahmad of Al Karak, was declared Sultan. Ahmad relocated to al Karak and left a deputy to rule on his behalf in Cairo. This unorthodox move, together with his seclusive and frivolous behavior and his execution of loyal partisans, ended with Ahmad's deposition and replacement by his half-brother as Saleh Ismail in June 1342. 
Ismaili ruled until his death in August 1345, and was succeeded by his brother al Kamil Shaban. The latter was killed in a Mamluk revolt and was succeeded by his brother al Muzaffar Haji, who was also killed in a Mamluk revolt in late 1347. Following Haji's death, the senior emirs of an Nazir Muhammad hastily appointed another of his sons, the 12 year old and Nazir Hassan, coinciding with Hassan's first term. In 1347 1348, the bubonic plague arrived in Egypt and other plagues followed, causing mass death in the country, which in turn led to major social and economic changes in the region. In 1351, Hassan attempted to assert his executive power and was ousted by the senior emirs, led by Emir Taz, and replaced with his brother, as Saleh Saleh. The emirs Sheikhu and Sergitmish deposed Saleh and restored Hassan in a coup in 1355, after which Hassan gradually purged Taz, Sheikhu and Sergitmish and their Mamluks from his administration. Concurrently, Hassan began recruiting and promoting the Alad al Nas, descendants of Mamluks who did not experience the enslavement, manumission process in the military and administration, a process that lasted for the remainder of the Bari period. This led to resentment from Hassan's own Mamluks, led by Emi Yalbuga al Umari, who killed Hassan in 1361. Yalbuga became the regent of Hassan's successor and the young son of the late Sultan Haji, al Mansur Muhammad. By then, Mamluk solidarity and loyalty to the emirs had dissipated. To restore discipline and unity within the Mamluk state and military, Yalbuga applied the rigorous educational methods used for Mamluks during the reigns of sultans Baybars and Kalawan. In 1365, attempts by the Mamluks to annex Armenia, which had since replaced Crusader Acre as the Christian commercial foothold of Asia, were stifled by an invasion of Alexandria by Peter I of Cyprus. The Mamluks concurrently experienced a deterioration of their lucrative position in international trade and the economy of the Sultanate declined, further weakening the Bari regime. Meanwhile, the perceived harshness of Yalbuga's educational methods and his refusal to rescind his disciplinary reforms led to a Mamluk backlash. Yalbuga was subsequently killed by his own Mamluks in an uprising in 1366. The rebellious Mamluks were supported by Sultan al Ashraf Shaban, who Yalbuga installed in 1363. Shaban was able to rule as the real power in the Sultanate until 1377, when he was killed by Mamluk dissidents on his way to Mecca to perform the Hajj. Burji rule Reign of Barkak Shaban was succeeded by his seven-year-old son Al-Mansa Ali, although the oligarchy of the senior emirs held the reins of power. Among the senior emirs who rose to prominence under Ali was Barkak, a Circassian Mamluk of Yalbuga who was involved in Sharaban's assassination, and Baraka, another of Yalbuga's Mamluks. Barkak was made Atabeg al asakir in 1378, giving him command of the Mamluk army, which he used to oust Baraka in 1380. Afterward, he managed to bring to Egypt his father Anas and many of his kinsmen, possibly in an attempt to establish a power base outside of the Mamluk establishment. Ali died in May 1381 and was succeeded by his nine-year-old brother, as Saleh Haji. However, power was in the hands of Barkak, as Saleh Haji's regent. Barkak tried to succeed Ali as sultan, but his bid was vetoed by the other senior emirs. Nonetheless, in the following year, Barkak toppled as Saleh Haji with the backing of Yalbuga's Mamluks and assumed the Sultanate, adopting the title of Baybars al -Malik az -Zahir. Barkak's accession had been made possible by the support of Yalbuga's Mamluks, whose subsequent rise to power also made Barkak's position vulnerable. His rule was challenged in Syria in 1389 during a revolt by the Mamluk governor of Malatya, Mintash, and the governor of Aleppo, Yalbuga and Naziri, who was a former Mamluk of both an Nazir Hassan and Yalbuga al-Umari. The rebels took over Syria and headed for Egypt, prompting Barkak to abdicate in favor of as Saleh Haji. The alliance between Yalbuga and Naziri and Mintash soon fell apart, however, and factional fighting ensued in Cairo ending with Mintash ousting Yalbuga. Barkak was arrested and exiled to al karak where he was able to rally support for his return to the throne. In Cairo, Barkak's loyalists took over the citadel and arrested as Saleh Haji. This paved the way for Barkak's usurpation of the Sultanate once more in February 1390, firmly establishing the Burji regime. Barkak solidified his control over the Sultanate in 1393, when his forces killed the major opponent to his rule, Mintash, in Syria. 
Barkix reign saw the mass recruitment of Circassians estimated at 5,000 recruits into the Mamluk ranks and the restoration of the Mamluk state's authority throughout its realm in the tradition of the early Mamluk sultans, Baybars and Kalawan. A major innovation to this system by Barkik was the division of Egypt into three provinces Neobat, similar to the administrative divisions in Syria. The new Egyptian Niyabas were Alexandria, Damanhur and Asyut. Barkik instituted this change as a means to better control the Egyptian countryside from the rising strength of the Arab tribes. To that end, Barkik dispatched the Berber Hawara tribesmen of the Nile Delta to Upper Egypt to keep the Arab tribes in check. During Barkik's reign, in 1387, the Mamluks were able to force the Anatolian entity in Sibas to become a Mamluk vassal state. Towards the end of the 14th century, challenges to the Mamluks emerged in Anatolia, including the Ottoman dynasty who absorbed the territory of the Karamanids in central Anatolia and installed the vassal as the leader of the Dulkadirids in 1399, and the Turkic allies of Timur, the Aq Koyonlu and Kara Koyunlu tribes who entered southern and eastern Anatolia in the same time period. Barkak entered into a brief engagement with Timur at the Euphrates in 1394, but Timur withdrew during that episode. Topic. Crises and restoration of state power Barkik died in 1399 and was succeeded by his 11-year-old son, and Nazir Faraj, who was in Damascus at the time. In that same year, Timur invaded Syria, sacking Aleppo before proceeding to sack Damascus. The latter had been abandoned by Faraj and his late father's entourage who left for Cairo. Timur ended his occupation of Syria in 1402 to pursue his war against the Ottomans in Anatolia, who he deemed to be a more dangerous threat to his rule. Faraj was able to hold on to power during this turbulent period, which in addition to Timur's devastating raids, the rise of Turkic tribes in Jazeera and attempts by Barkik's emirs to topple Faraj, also saw a famine in Egypt in 1403, a severe plague in 1405 and a Bedouin revolt that virtually ended the Mamluks' hold over Upper Egypt between 1401 and 1413. Thus, Mamluk authority throughout the Sultanate was significantly eroded. While the capital Cairo experienced an economic crisis, Faraj was toppled in 1412 by the Syria based emirs, Tanim, Jakam, Noruz, and Al Muayyad Sheikh, who Faraj sent a total of seven military expeditions against during his reign. The emirs could not usurp the throne themselves, however, and had Caliph al Mustayan installed. The Caliph had the support of the non Circassian Mamluks and legitimacy with the local population. Six months later, Shakai eased al Mustayan out of power after neutralizing his main rival, Noruz, and assumed the Sultanate. Sheikh's main goal in office was restoration of the state's authority within the Sultanate, which saw further plagues in 1415 to 1417 and 1420. During his reign, Sheikh re established the state's fiscal administration to replenish the treasury. To that end, his fiscal administrator led tax collection expeditions that were akin to plundering throughout the Sultanate to compensate for the tax arrears that had accumulated under Farajay's reign. Sheikh also commissioned and led military expeditions against the Mamluks' enemies in Anatolia, reasserting the state's influence in that region. Topic. Reign of Basbi Before Sheikh died in 1421, he sought to offset the power of the Circassian Mamluks by importing Turkish Mamluks and installing a Turk as Atabeg al Asakir in 1420 to serve as regent for his infant son Ahmad. However, following his death, a Circassian emir, Tata, married Sheikh's widow, ousted the Atabeg al Asakir and assumed power. Tata died three months into his reign and was succeeded by Basbi, another Circassian emir of Barkik. In 1422, Basbi pursued an economic policy of establishing state monopolies over the lucrative trade with Europe, particularly regarding spices, to the chagrin of the civilian merchants of the Sultanate. Moreover, Basbi compelled Red Sea traders to offload their goods at the Mamluk held Hehazi port of Jeddah rather than the Yemeni port of Aden in order to derive the most financial benefit from the Red Sea transit route to Europe. Basbi also undertook efforts to better protect the caravan routes to the Hejaz from Bedouin raids and the Egyptian Mediterranean coast from Catalan and Genoese piracy. With regards to European pirates, he launched campaigns against Cyprus in 1425–1426, during which the island's king was taken captive, because of his alleged assistance to the pirates. The large ransoms paid to the Mamluks by the Cypriots allowed them to mint new gold coinage for the first time since the 14th century. 
Barsby's efforts at monopolization and trade protection were meant to offset the severe financial losses of the Sultanate's agricultural sector due to the frequent recurring plagues that took a heavy toll on the farmers. Barsby launched military expeditions against the Aq Koyonlu in 1429 and 1433. The first expedition involved the sacking of Edessa and the massacre of its Muslim inhabitants in retaliation for the Aq Koyonlu's raids against the Mamluks' Mesopotamian territories. The second expedition was against the Aq Koyonlu capital of Amid, which ended with the Aq Koyonlu recognizing Mamluk suzerainty. While the Mamluks were able to force the Anatolian Beyliks to generally submit to their hegemony in the region, Mamluk authority in Upper Egypt was largely relegated to the emirs of the Hawara tribe. The latter had grown wealthy from their burgeoning trade with Central Africa and achieved a degree of local popularity due to their piety, education and generally benign treatment of the inhabitants. Topic. Fall While the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid II was engaged in Europe, a new round of conflict broke out between Egypt and the Safavid dynasty in Persia in 1501. Shah Ismail I sent an embassy to Venice and Syria inviting him to join arms and recover the territory taken from him by the port. Ottomans. Mamluk Egyptian Sultan al Ghorai was told by Selim I that he was providing the envoys of the Safavid Ishmael the first safe passage through Syria on their way to Venice and harboring refugees. To appease him, al Ghorai placed in confinement the Venetian merchants then in Syria and Egypt, but after a year released them. After the Battle of Chaldiran in 1514, Selim I attacked the Dulkadirids, an Egyptian vassal, and sent his head to Mamluk Sultan al Ashraf Kansur al Ghorai. Secure now against Shah Ismail I, in AD 1516 he drew together a great army aiming at conquering Egypt, but to deceive it he represented his army to further the war against Shah Ismail I. The war started in 1516 which led to the later incorporation of Egypt and its dependencies in the Ottoman Empire, with Mamluk cavalry proving no match for the Ottoman artillery and the Janissaries. On August 24, 1516, at the Battle of Marj Dabak Sultan al Ghorai was killed. Syria passed into Ottoman Turkish possession, who were welcomed in many places as deliverance from the Mamluks. The Mamluk Sultanate survived until 1517, when it was conquered by the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Sultan Selim I captured Cairo on January 20, the center of power transferred then to Constantinople. On January 25, the Mamluk Sultanate collapsed. Although not in the same form as under the Sultanate, the Ottoman Empire retained the Mamluks as an Egyptian ruling class and the Mamluks and the Burji family succeeded in regaining much of their influence, but remained vassals of the Ottomans. Although the Mamluk Sultanate was ended by the Ottoman conquest, the Mamluks as a self-perpetuating, largely Turkish-speaking warrior class continued to influence politics under Ottoman rule. Between 1688 and 1755, Mamluk Beys, allied with Bedouins and factions within the Ottoman garrison, deposed no fewer than 34 governors. The Mamluk influence remained a force in Egyptian politics until their notoriously abrupt end at the hands of Muhammad Ali in 1811. Topic. Society Topic. Language By the time the Mamluks took power, Arabic had already been established as the language of religion, culture and the bureaucracy in Egypt, and was widespread among non-Muslim communities there as well. Arabic's wide use among Muslim and non-Muslim commoners had likely been motivated by their aspiration to learn the language of the ruling and scholarly elite. Another contributing factor was the wave of Arab tribal migration to Egypt and subsequent intermarriage between Arabs and the indigenous population. The Mamluks contributed to the expansion of Arabic in Egypt through their victory over the Mongols and the Crusaders and the subsequent creation of a Muslim haven in Egypt and Syria for Arabic-speaking immigrants from other conquered Muslim lands. The continuing invasions of Syria by Mongol armies led to further waves of Syrian immigrants, including scholars and artisans, to Egypt. Although Arabic was used as the administrative language of the Sultanate, Turkish was the spoken language of the Mamluk ruling elite. According to Petri, the Mamluks regarded Turkish as their caste's vehicle of communication, even though they themselves spoke Central Asian dialects such as Kipjak, or Circassian, a Caucasian language. According to historian Michael Winter, Turkishness was the distinctive aspect of the Mamluk ruling elite, for only they knew how to speak Turkish and had Turkish names. 
While the Mamluk elite was ethnically diverse, those who were not Turkic in origin were Turkicized nonetheless. As such she ethnically Circassian Mamluks who gained prominence with the rise of the Burji regime and became the dominant ethnic element of the government, were educated in the Turkish language and were considered to be Turks by the Arabic-speaking population. The ruling military elite of the Sultanate was exclusive to those of Mamluk background, with rare exceptions. Ethnicity served as a major factor separating the mostly Turkic or Turkicized Mamluk elite from their Arabic-speaking subjects. Ethnic origin was a key component of an individual Mamluk's identity, and ethnic identity manifested itself through given names, dress, access to administrative positions and was indicated by a sultan's nisbah. The sons of Mamluks, known as the Alad al-Nas, did not typically hold positions in the military elite and instead, were often part of the civilian administration or the Muslim religious establishment. Among the Bari sultans and emirs, there existed a degree of pride of their Kipchak Turkish roots, and their non-Kipchak usurpers such as sultans Kipuka, Baybars II and Lajan were often delegitimized in the Bari era sources for their non-Kipchak origins. The Mamluk elites of the Burji period were also apparently proud of their Circassian origins. Religion Topic. Muslim community A wide range of Islamic religious expression existed in Egypt during the early Mamluk era, namely Sunni Islam and its major madhabs, schools of thought, and various Sufi orders, but also small communities of Ismaili Shia Muslims, particularly in Upper Egypt. In addition, there was a significant minority of Coptic Christians. Under Sultan Saladin, the Ayyubids embarked on a program of reviving and strengthening Sunni Islam in Egypt to counter Christianity, which had been reviving under the religiously benign rule of the Fatimids, and Ismailism, the branch of Islam of the Fatimid state. Under the Bari Sultans, the promotion of Sunni Islam was pursued more vigorously than under the Ayyubids. The Mamluks were motivated in this regard by personal piety or political expediency for Islam was both an assimilating and unifying factor between the Mamluks and the majority of their subjects. The early Mamluks had been brought up as Sunni Muslims and the Muslim faith was the only aspect of life shared between the Mamluk ruling elite and its subjects. While the precedent set by the Ayyubids highly influenced the Mamluk state's embrace of Sunni Islam, the circumstances in the Muslim Middle East in the aftermath of the Crusader and Mongol invasions also left Mamluk Egypt as the last major Islamic power able to confront the Crusaders and the Mongols. Thus, the early Mamluk embrace of Sunni Islam also stemmed from the pursuit of a moral unity within their realm based on the majority views of its subjects. The Mamluks sought to cultivate and utilize Muslim leaders to channel the religious feelings of the Sultanate's Muslim subjects in a manner that did not disrupt the Sultanate's authority. Similar to their Ayyubid predecessors, the Bari Sultans showed particular favoritism towards the Shafi'i Madhab, while also promoting the other major Sunni Madhabs, namely the Maliki, Hanbali, and Hanafi. Baybars ended the Ayyubid and early Mamluk tradition of selecting a Shafi'i scholar as Qadi al Quda chief judge, and instead had a Qadi al Quda appointed from each of the former dabs. This policy change may have been partly motivated by a desire to accommodate an increasingly diverse Muslim population whose components had immigrated to Egypt from regions where other madabs were prevalent. Ultimately, however, the diffusion of the post of Qadi al Quda among the four Madhabs enabled Mamluk sultans to act as patrons for each Madhab and thus gain more influence over them. Regardless of the policy change, the Shafi'i scholars maintained a number of privileges over their colleagues from the other Madhabs. The Mamluks also embraced the various Sufi orders that existed in the Sultanate. Sufism was widespread in Egypt by the 13th century, and the Shadhiliya was the most popular Sufi order. The Shadhiliya lacked an institutional structure and was flexible in its religious thought, allowing it to easily adapt to its local environment. It incorporated Sunni Islamic piety with its basis in the Quran and Hadith, Sufi mysticism, and elements of popular religion such as sainthood, ziyarat visitation, to the tombs of saintly or religious individuals, and dhikr, invocation of God. Other Sufi orders with large numbers of adherents were the Rifiya and Badawiya. While the Mamluks patronized the Sunni ulama through appointments to government office, they patronized the Sufis by funding sawais, Sufi lodges. On the other end of the spectrum of Sunni religious expression were the teachings of the Hanbali scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, which emphasized stringent moral rigor based on literal interpretations of the Quran and the Sunnah, and a deep hostility to the aspects of mysticism and popular religious innovations promoted by the various Sufi orders. 
While Ibn Taymiyyah was not a typical representative of Sunni orthodoxy in the Sultanate, he was the most prominent Muslim scholar of the Mamluk era and was arrested numerous times by the Mamluk government for his religious teachings, which are still influential in the modern-day Muslim world. Ibn Taymiyyah's doctrines were regarded as being heretic by the Sunni establishment patronized by the Mamluks. Topic. Christian and Jewish communities Christians and Jews in the Sultanate were governed by the dual authority of their respective religious institutions and the Sultan. The authority of the former extended to many of the everyday aspects of Christian and Jewish life and was not restricted to the religious practices of the two respective communities. The Mamluk government, often under the official banner of the Pact of Umar which gave Christians and Jews dhimmi, protected peoples status, ultimately determined the taxes that Christians and Jews paid to the Sultanate, including the jia, tax on non-Muslims, whether a house of worship could be constructed and the public appearance of Christians and Jews. Jews generally fared better than Christians, and the latter experienced more difficulty under Mamluk rule than under previous Muslim powers. The association of Christians with the Mongols, due to the latter's use of Armenian and Georgian Christian auxiliaries, the attempted alliance between the Mongols and the Crusader powers, and the massacre of Muslim communities and the sparing of Christians in cities captured by the Mongols, may have contributed to rising anti-Christian sentiments in the Mamluk era. The manifestations of anti-Christian hostility were mostly spearheaded at the popular level rather than under the direction of Mamluk sultans. The main source of popular hostility was resentment at the privileged positions many Christians held in the Mamluk bureaucracy. The Coptic decline in Egypt occurred under the Bari sultans and accelerated further under the Burji regime. There were several instances of Egyptian Muslim protests against the wealth of Coptic Christians and their employment with the state, and both Muslim and Christian rioters burned down each other's houses of worship in times of intercommunal tensions. As a result of popular pressure, Coptic Christians had their employment in the bureaucracy terminated at least nine times between the late 13th and mid-15th centuries, and on one occasion, in 1301, the government ordered the closure of all churches. Coptic bureaucrats would often be restored to their positions after the moment of tension passed. Many Coptic Christians decided to convert to Islam or at least adopt the outward expressions of Muslim faith to protect their employment, avoid geotaxation and avoid official measures against them. The 14th century saw a large wave of Coptic conversions to Islam, and by the end of the Mamluk period, the ratio of Muslims to Christians in Egypt may have risen to 10 to 1. In Syria, the Mamluks uprooted the local Maronite and Greek Orthodox Christians from the coastal areas as a means to prevent their potential contact with European powers. The Maronite Church was especially suspected by the Mamluks of collaboration with the Europeans due to the high degree of relations between the Maronite Church and the papacy in Rome and the Christian European powers, particularly Cyprus. The Greek Orthodox Church experienced a decline following the Mamluk destruction of its spiritual center, Antioch, and the Timurid destruction of Aleppo and Damascus in 1400. The Syriac Christians also experienced a significant decline in Syria due to intracommunal disputes over patriarchal succession and the destruction of churches by the Timurids or local Kurdish tribes. The Mamluks brought about a similar decline of the Armenian Orthodox Church after their capture of the Armenian Cilician Kingdom in 1374. In addition to the raids of the Timurids in 1386 and the conflict between the Timurids and the nomadic Turkmen Aq Koyunlu and Kara Koyunlu tribal confederations in Cilicia. Topic. Bedouin relationship with the state Bedouin tribes served as a reserve force in the Mamluk military. Under the third reign of An-Nazir Muhammad in particular, the Bedouin tribes, particularly those of Syria, such as the Al-Fadl, were strengthened and integrated into the economy as well. Bedouin tribes were also a major source of the Mamluk cavalry's Arabian horses. Karluan purchased horses from the Bedouin Abaka, Cyrenaica, which were inexpensive but of high quality, while in Nazir Muhammad spent extravagant sums for horses from numerous Bedouin sources, including Barka, Syria, Iraq and Bahrain, Sultans Baybars and Karluan, and the Syrian viceroys of Nazir Muhammad during his first two reigns, Emirs Salah and Baybars II, were averse to granting Bedouin sheikhs Iqtayat, and when they did, the Iqtayat were of low quality. However, during in Nazir Muhammad's third reign, the Al Fadl were granted high quality IQTA in abundance, strengthening the tribe to become the most powerful among the Bedouin of the Syrian desert region. 
Beyond his personal admiration of the Bedouin, and Nazir Muhammad's motivation for distributing IQTA to al Fadl, especially under the leadership of Mahana ibn Isa, was to prevent him from defecting to the Ilkhanate, which their leaders had done frequently in the first half of the 14th century. Competition over Iqta in the post of Amir al-Arab among the Bedouin tribes of Syria, particularly the al-Fadl, led to conflict and rebellion among the two tribes and other Bedouin, leading to mass bloodshed in Syria in the aftermath of al-Nazir Muhammad's death. The Mamluk leadership in Syria, weakened by the losses of the Black Plague, was unable to quell the Bedouin through military expeditions, so they resolved to assassinate the sheikhs of the tribes, including those of Upper Egypt. The Al Fadl tribe eventually lost favor, while the Bedouin tribes of Al Karak were strengthened by the later Bari sultans. In Egypt, the Mamluks, particularly during a Nazir Muhammad's third reign, had a similar relationship with the Bedouin as in Syria. The Isa ibn Hassan al Hajan tribe became powerful in the country after being assigned massive Iqtayat. The tribe remained strong after a Nazir Muhammad's death, but frequently rebelled against the succeeding Bari sultans, but were restored each time, before its sheikh was finally executed as a rebel in 1353. In Shakia in Lower Egypt, the Thalaba tribes were charged with overseeing the postal routes, but they were often unreliable in this regard and ultimately joined the al Aid tribes during their raids. Bedouin tribal wars frequently disrupted trade and travel in Upper Egypt, and caused the destruction of cultivated lands and sugar processing plants. In the mid-14th century, Bedouin tribes in Upper Egypt, namely the rival Arak and Banu Hilal, became the de facto rulers of the region, forcing the Mamluks to rely on them for tax collection. The Bedouin were ultimately purged from Upper and Lower Egypt by the campaigns of Emir Sheku in 1353. Topic. Government The Mamluks did not significantly alter the administrative, legal and economic systems that they inherited from the Ayyubid state. The Mamluk territorial domain was virtually the same as that of the Ayyubid state i.e. Egypt, Levant and Hejaz. However, unlike the collective sovereignty of the Ayyubids where territory was divided among members of the royal family, the Mamluk state was unitary. Under certain Ayyubid sultans, Egypt had paramountcy over the Syrian provinces, but under the Mamluks this paramountcy was consistent and absolute. Cairo remained the capital of the Sultanate and its social, economic and administrative center, with the Cairo Citadel serving as the Sultan's headquarters. The foundation of Mamluk organization and factional unity was based on the principles of Kushdashia, defined by historian Amalia Lebanoni as, "...the fostering of a common bond between Mamluks who belong to the household of a single master and their loyalty towards him." Kushdashia was likewise a crucial component of a Sultan's authority and power. Topic. Authority of the Sultan The Mamluk Sultan was the ultimate authority, while he delegated power to provincial governors known as Nuwabas Sultana, Deputy Sultans, Singh. Naibas Sultana. Generally, the vice-regent of Egypt was the most senior naib, followed by the governor of Damascus, then Aleppo, then the governors of al Karak, Safad, Tripoli, Homs and Hama. In Hama, the Mamluks had permitted the Ayyubids to continue to govern until 1341. Its popular governor in 1320, Abul Fida, was granted the title Sultan by Sultan and Nazir Muhammad, but otherwise the new Wab of the provinces were Mamluk emirs. A consistent accession process occurred with every new Mamluk Sultan. It more or less involved the election of a Sultan by a council of emirs and Mamluks, who would give him an oath of loyalty. The Sultan's assumption of the monarchical title Al Malik, a state organized procession through Cairo at the head of which was the Sultan, and the reading of the Sultan's name in the Qutbah, Friday prayer sermon. The process was not formalized and the electoral body was never defined, but typically consisted of the emirs and Mamluks of whatever Mamluk faction held sway. Usurpations of the throne by rival factions were relatively common. Despite the electoral nature of accession, dynastic succession was nonetheless a reality at times, particularly during the Bari regime, where Baybar's sons Baraka and Solomish succeeded him, before Kalawan usurped the throne and was thereafter succeeded by four generations of direct descendants, with occasional interruptions. Hereditary rule was much less frequent during the Burji regime. Nonetheless, with rare exception, the Burji sultans were all linked to the regime's founder Barkik through blood or Mamluk affiliation. The accession of blood relatives to the Sultanate was often the result of the decision or indecision of senior Mamluk emirs or the will of the preceding Sultan. 
the latter's situation applied to the Sultan's Baybars, Kaluan, the latter's son, and Nazir Muhammad and Barkak, who formally arranged for one or more of their sons to succeed them. More often than not, the sons of sultans were elected by the senior emirs with the ultimate intention that they serve as convenient figureheads presiding over an oligarchy of the emirs. Lesser ranked Mamluk emirs viewed the sultan more as a peer whom they entrusted with ultimate authority and as a benefactor whom they expected would guarantee their salaries and monopoly on the military. When emirs felt the sultan was not ensuring their benefits, disruptive riots, coup plots, or delays to calls for service were all likely scenarios. Often, the practical restrictions on a sultan's power came from his own kashdashia or from other emirs, with whom there was constant tension, particularly in times of peace with external enemies. According to Holt, the factious nature of emirs who were not the sultan's kashdashia derived from the primary loyalty of emirs and mamluks to their own ustad master, before the sultan. However, emirs who were part of the sultan's kashdashia also rebelled at times, particularly the governors of Syria who formed power bases within their territory. Typically, the faction most loyal to the Sultan were the royal Mamluks, particularly those Mamluks whom the Sultan had personally recruited and manumitted. This was in contrast to the Naranis, who were those in the royal Mamluks ranks who had been recruited by a Sultan's predecessors and thus lacked Kashdashia bonds with the Sultan. The Naranis occasionally constituted a hostile faction to a Sultan, such as in the case of Sultan as Saleh Ayyub and the Kalawani successors of a Nazir Muhammad. The Sultan was the head of state and among his powers and responsibilities were issuing and enforcing specific legal orders and general rules, making the decision to go to war, levying taxes for military campaigns, ensuring the proportionate distribution of food supplies throughout the Sultanate and, in some cases, overseeing the investigation and punishment of alleged criminals. A Mamluk Sultan or his appointees led the annual Hajj pilgrimage caravans from Cairo and Damascus in the capacity of Amir al-Hajj, commander of the Hajj caravan. Starting with Kalawan, the Mamluks also monopolized the tradition of providing the annual decorated covering of the Kaaba, in addition to patronizing Jerusalem's Dome of the Rock. Another prerogative, at least of the early Bari sultans, was to import as many Mamluks as possible into the Sultanate, preferring those who originated from the territories of the Mongols. However, the Mamluks' enemies, such as the Mongol powers and their Muslim vassals, the Armenians and the Crusaders, successfully disrupted the flow of Mamluks into the Sultanate. Unable to meet the military's need for new Mamluks, the sultans often resorted to turning Ilkhanid deserters or prisoners of war into soldiers, sometimes while the war the prisoners were captured in was still ongoing. Topic. Role of the Caliph To legitimize their rule, the Mamluks presented themselves as the defenders of Islam, and, beginning with Baybars, sought the confirmation of their executive authority from a caliph. The Ayyubids had owed their allegiance to the Abbasid Caliphate, but the latter was destroyed when the Mongols sacked the Abbasid capital Baghdad in 1258 and killed Caliph al-Mustazm. Three years later, Baybars re-established the institution of the caliphate by making a member of the Abbasid family, al-Mustansi, caliph, who in turn confirmed Baybars as sultan. In addition, the caliph recognized the sultan's authority over Egypt, Syria, Mesopotamia, Diyarbakir, the Hejaz and Yemen and any territory conquered from the Crusaders or Mongols. Al-Mustansi's Abbasid successors continued in their official capacity as caliphs, but virtually held no power in the Mamluk government. The brief reign of Caliph al-Mustaran as sultan in 1412 was an anomaly. In an anecdotal testament to the caliph's lack of real authority, a group of rebellious Mamluks responded to Sultan Lajan's presentation of the Caliph al-Hakim's decree asserting Lajan's authority with the following comment, recorded by Ibn Tughraberti, stupid fellow. For God's sake! Who pays any heed to the caliph now? Topic. Military and administrative hierarchy The Mamluk sultans were products of the military hierarchy, entry into which was virtually restricted to Mamluks, i.e. those soldiers who were imported while young slaves. However, the sons of Mamluks could enter and rise high within the ranks of the military hierarchy, but typically did not enter military service. Instead, many entered into mercantile, scholastic or other civilian careers. The army Baybars inherited consisted of Kurdish and Turkish tribesmen, refugees from the various Ayyubid armies of Syria and other troops from armies dispersed by the Mongols. Following the Battle of Anjalat, Baybars restructured the army into three components, the Royal Mamluk Regiment, the soldiers of the Emirs, and the Halka non soldiers. 
The royal Mamluks, who were under the direct command of the Sultan, were the highest ranking body within the army, entry into which was exclusive. The royal Mamluks were virtually the private corps of the Sultan. The lower ranking emirs also had their own corps, which were akin to private armies. The soldiers of the emirs were directly commanded by the emirs, but could be mobilized by the Sultan when needed. As emirs were promoted, the number of soldiers in their corps increased, and when rival emirs challenged each other's authority, they would often utilize their respective forces, leading to major disruptions of civilian life. The Halka had inferior status to the Mamluk regiments. It had its own administrative structure and was under the direct command of the Sultan. The Halka regiments declined in the 14th century when professional non Mamluk soldiers generally stopped joining the force. The Ayyubid army had lacked a clear and permanent hierarchical system, and one of Baybar's early reforms was creating a military hierarchy. To that end, he began the system of assigning emirs ranks of 10, 40, and 100, with the particular number indicating how many mounted Mamluk troops were assigned to an emir's command. In addition, an emir of 100 could be assigned 1,000 mounted troops during battle. Baybars instituted uniformity within the army and put an end to the previous improvised nature of the various Ayyubid military forces of Egypt and Syria. To bring further uniformity to the military, Baybars and Karlawan standardized the undefined Ayyubid policies regarding the distribution of IQTA to emirs. The reformation of IQTA distribution created a clear link between an emir's rank and the size of his IQTA. For example, an emir of 40 would be given an IQTA a third of the size of an emir of 100's IQTA. Baybars also began bi-weekly inspections of the troops to verify that sultanich orders were carried out, in addition to the periodic inspections in which he would distribute new weaponry to the Mamluk troops. Starting with the reign of Karlawan, the Sultan and the military administration maintained lists of all emirs throughout the Sultanate and defined their roles as part of the right or left flanks of the army should they be mobilized for war. Gradually, as Mamluks increasingly filled administrative and courtier posts within the state, Mamluk innovations to the Ayyubid hierarchy were developed. The officers of Ustadar, Majidomo, Hajib, Chamberlain, Emir Jandar and Kazandar, Treasurer, which existed during the Ayyubid period, were preserved, but Baybars established the additional officers of Dawada, Emir Akher, Ruz al-Nawab and Emir Majlis. The administrative officers were largely ceremonial posts and were closely connected to various elements of the military hierarchy. The Ustadar, from the Arabic Ustad al-Dar, Master of the House was the chief of staff of the Sultan, responsible for organizing the royal court's daily activities, managing the personal budget of the Sultan and supervising all of the buildings of the Cairo Citadel and its staff. The Ustadar was often referred to as the Ustadar al-Aliyah, Grand Master of the House, to distinguish from Ustadar Sa'is, lesser majordomos, whose authority was subordinate to the Ustadar al-Aliyah and who oversaw specific aspects of the court and citadel, such as the Sultan's treasury, private property and the kitchens of the citadel. Mamluk emirs also had their own Ustadas. The office of Ustadar al-Aliyah became a powerful post beginning in the late 14th century, particularly so under Sultans Barkakan and Nazir Faraj, who transferred the responsibilities of the special bureau for their Mamluks to the authority of the Ustadar, thus turning the latter into the Sultanate's chief financial official. Topic. Economy The Mamluk economy essentially consisted of two spheres, the state economy, which was organized along the lines of an elite household and was controlled by a virtual caste government headed by the Sultan, and the free market economy, which was the domain of society in general and which was associated with the native inhabitants in contrast to the ethnically foreign origins of the Mamluk ruling elite. The Mamluks introduced greater centralization over the economy by organizing the state bureaucracy, particularly in Cairo. Damascus and Aleppo already had organized bureaucracies, and the Mamluk military hierarchy and its associated IQTA system. In Egypt in particular, the Nile River's centralizing influence also contributed to Mamluk centralization over the region. The Mamluks used the same currency system as the Ayyubids, which consisted of gold dinars, silver dirhams and copper fullas. In general, the monetary system during the Mamluk period was highly unstable due to frequent monetary changes enacted by various sultans. Increased circulation of copper coins and the increased use of copper in dirhams often led to inflation. The Mamluks created an administrative body called the Hizba to supervise the market, with a mutajib inspector general in charge of the body. There were four mutasibs based in Cairo, Alexandria, Al Fustat, and Lower Egypt. The Mutajib in Cairo was the most senior of the four and his position was akin to that of a finance minister. 
The role of a mutajib was to inspect weights and measures and the quality of goods, maintain legal trade, and to remain vigilant of price gouging. Typically, a Qadi or Muslim scholar would occupy the post, but in the 15th century, Mamluk emirs began to be appointed as mutasibs in an effort to compensate emirs during cash shortages or as a result of the gradual shift of the mutajib's role from the legal realm to one of enforcement. Topic. IQTA system The IQTA system was inherited from the Ayyubids and further organized under the Mamluks to fit their military needs. IQTA were a central component of the Mamluk power structure. The IQTA of the Muslims differed from the European concept of fiefs in that IQTA represented a right to collect revenue from a fixed territory and was accorded to an officer emir, as income and as a financial source to provision his soldiers. However, prior to the Mamluks' rise, there was a growing tendency of IQTA holders to treat their IQTA as personal property, which they passed down to their descendants. The Mamluks effectively put an end to this tendency, with the exception of some areas, namely in Mount Lebanon, where long-time Druze IQTA holders, who became part of the Halqa, were able to resist the abolition of their hereditary IQTA at. In the Mamluk era, the IQTA was an emir's principal source of income, and starting in 1337, Mamluk IQTA holders would lease or sell rights to their IQTA to non-Mamluks in order to derive greater revenues. By 1343, the practice was common and by 1347, the sale of Iktara became taxed. The revenues emanating from the IQTA also served as a more stable source of income than other methods the Mamluks sometimes employed, including tax hikes, the sale of administrative posts and extortion of the population. According to historian J. Van Steenbergen, the IQTA system was fundamental in assuring a legitimized, controlled and guaranteed access to the resources of the Syro-Egyptian realm to an upper level of Mamluk society that was primarily military in form and organization. As such it was a fundamental feature of Mamluk society, on the one hand giving way to a military hierarchy that crystallized into an even more developed economic hierarchy and that had substantial economic interests in society at large, on the other hand, it deeply characterized the realm's economic and social development, its agriculture, grain trade, and rural demography in particular. The system largely consisted of land assignments from the state in return for military services. Land was assessed by the periodic Rock cadastral survey, which consisted of a survey of land parcels measured by Fedden units, assessment of land quality and the annual estimated tax revenue of the parcels, and classification of a parcel's legal status as WAQF trust, or IQTA. The Rock surveys organized the IQTA system and the first Rock was carried out in 1298 under Sultan Lajan. A second and final rock was completed in 1315 under Sultan and Nazir Muhammad and influenced political and economic developments of the Mamluk Sultanate until its fall in the early 16th century. Over time, the IQTA system was expanded, and increasingly larger areas of Karaj taxable lands were appropriated as IQTA lands in order to meet the fiscal needs of the Mamluk military institution, namely payment of Mamluk officers and their subordinates. The Mamluk state resolved to increase allotments by dispersing an individual emir's IQTA at over several provinces and for brief terms. However, this led to a situation where the IQTA holders neglected the administrative oversight, maintenance and infrastructure of their IQTA at, while concentrating solely on collecting revenues, thereby resulting in less productivity of the IQTA at. Topic. Agriculture. Agriculture was the primary source of revenue in the Mamluk economy. Agricultural products were the main exports of Mamluk Egypt, Syria and Palestine. Moreover, the major industries of sugar and textile production were also dependent on agricultural products, namely sugar cane and cotton, respectively. Every agricultural commodity was taxed by the state, with the Sultan's treasury taking the largest share of the revenues, emirs and major private brokers followed. An emir's main source of income were the agricultural products of his IQTA, and with those revenues, he was able to fund his private corps. In Egypt, Mamluk centralization over agricultural production was more thorough than in Syria and Palestine for a number of reasons. Among them was that virtually all agriculture in Egypt depended on a single source of irrigation, the Nile, and the measures and rights to irrigation were determined by the river's flooding, whereas in Syria and Palestine, there were multiple sources of mostly rain-fed irrigation, and measures and rights were thus determined at the local level. 
Centralization over Syria and Palestine was also more complicated than in Egypt due to the diversity of those regions' geography and the frequent invasions of the Syro-Palestinian territories. The state's role in Syro-Palestinian agriculture was restricted to the fiscal administration and to the irrigation networks and other aspects of rural infrastructure. Although the level of centralization was not as high as in Egypt, the Mamluks did impose enough control over the Syrian economy to derive revenues from Syria that benefited the Sultanate and contributed to the defense of its realm. Furthermore, the maintenance of the Mamluk army in Syria relied on the state's control over Syrian agricultural revenues. Among the responsibilities of a Mamluk provincial or district governor were repopulating depopulated areas to foster agricultural production, protecting the lands from Bedouin raids, increasing productivity in barren lands, likely through the upkeep and expansion of existing irrigation networks, and devoting special attention to the cultivation of the more arable low lying regions. In order to ensure that rural life was undisturbed by Bedouin raiding, which could halt agricultural work or damage crops and agrarian infrastructure and thus decrease revenues, the Mamluks attempted to prevent Bedouin armament and confiscate existing weapons from them. Topic. Trade and industry Egypt and Syria played a central transit role in international trade in the Middle Ages. Early into their rule, the Mamluks sought to expand their role in foreign trade, and to this end Baybars signed a commercial treaty with Genoa, while Carloan signed a similar agreement with Ceylon. By the 15th century, internal upheaval as a result of Mamluk power struggles, diminishing IQTA revenues as a result of plagues, and the encroachment of abandoned farmlands by Bedouin tribes led to a financial crisis in the Sultanate. To make up for these losses, the Mamluks applied a three-pronged approach, taxation of the urban middle classes, increasing the production and sale of cotton and sugar to Europe, and taking advantage of their transit position in the trade between the Far East and Europe. The latter proved to be the most profitable method and was done by cultivating trade relationships with Venetia, Genoa and Barcelona, and increasing taxes on commodities. Thus, during the 15th century, the long-established trade between Europe and the Islamic world began to make up a significant part of the Sultanate's revenues as the Mamluks imposed taxes on the merchants who operated or passed through the Sultanate's ports. Mamluk Egypt was a major producer of textiles and a supplier of raw materials for Western Europe. However, the frequent outbreaks of the Black Plague led to a decline in the Mamluk territory's production of goods such as textiles, silk products, sugar, glass, soaps, and paper, which coincided with the Europeans' increasing production of these goods. Trade continued nonetheless and despite papal restrictions on trade with the Muslims during the Crusades. Mediterranean trade was dominated by spices, such as pepper, muscat nuts and flowers, cloves and cinnamon, as well as medicinal drugs and indigo. These goods originated in Persia, India, and Southeast Asia and made their way to Europe via the Mamluk ports of Syria and Egypt. These ports were frequented by European merchants, who in turn sold gold and silver ducats and bullion, silk, wool and linen fabrics, furs, wax, honey and cheeses. Under Sultan Basby, a state monopoly was established on luxury goods, namely spices, in which the state set prices and collected a percentage of profits. To that end, in 1387, Basby established direct control over Alexandria, the principal Egyptian commercial port, thereby transferring the tax revenues of the port to the Sultan's personal treasury Diwan al instead of the imperial treasury which was linked with the military's IQTA system. Furthermore, in 1429, he ordered that the spice trade to Europe be conducted through Cairo before goods reached Alexandria, thus attempting to end the direct transportation of spices from the Red Sea to Alexandria. In the late 15th and early 16th centuries the Portuguese Empire's expansion into Africa and Asia began to significantly decrease the revenues of the Mamluk Venetian monopoly on the trans-Mediterranean trade. This contributed to and coincided with the fall of the Sultanate. Topic. List of Sultans Topic. See also Ferizia Egypt in the Middle Ages List of Sunni Muslim dynasties <laughs>